Good morning or good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you are in the world. Um, welcome to today's peer-to-peer uh, -peer workshop conducted by uh, Mr. Joseph Makuvele. I'm just going to do a short introduction for Joseph, and then Joseph can proceed with the presentation. So Joseph, he has more than 20 years in the HEC field, both locally and abroad, and is currently employed in the Middle East for Saudi Aramco. He holds a BTEC degree in environmental health, majoring in occupational health and safety. He has a Nibosh International Diploma, an MBA, MAP, MPH Occupational Hygiene. His thesis is pending. Today's discussion he will be conducting is based on the safety officer, safety professional competencies and certifications. Thank you very much, Joseph. You can proceed. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Joseph. Um, can I share my screen? Yes, sir. You may share your screen. You may go ahead. Can you see it? Yes, we can, Joseph. Okay. Good morning, everyone. And, and happy Eid Mubarak to our Muslim brothers and sisters. Um, this morning, I'll be speaking to you on a subject, safety professional competencies and certifications. Um, of note is safety is a noble profession and we should uphold it in that, in that high regard. Uh, in my journey as a safety professional, um, I started as an occupational hygienist. Then I became a safety manager for the railways. Then I became a regional manager at uh, Lafage. And I became a national manager for one of the gas companies in, in South Africa. Then I became a group she manager for one of the manufacturing companies in, in Johannesburg. <clears throat> um, in an attempt to uphold safety as a noble profession, I found myself in a situation where I was, I was challenged and to a certain degree frustrated. Uh, I remember one instance, one of the CEO of the companies I worked for, he said, you are an overhead. And I, had, and I believe that some of you might have had similar um, statements like you are a cost to the company. Where you are, you say safety first. And he also goes on to say the law says you continue to say that thou shall comply, you know, the compliance guy. And then you complain in your corner and you say management do not support safety. And without you knowing, actually you are operating in a safety silo. And then the reality is safety is not a priority, but a business value. In that values are constant, they do not change, but priorities are changeable, they change with time. I also learned that legal compliance does not make us safe, safer. Minimum legal requirements do not make you safe. Uh, the same as safety procedures, policies, they do not make us any safer, but the application does. I learned that for me to uphold safety as a noble profession, I had to collaborate the organization to focus on outcomes, which is the triple bottom line. People, plant, 
and profit. Knowledge is good, but application of the very same knowledge is more important. One can ask what is what are competencies or what competency is. Competency is the ability of an individual to do a job properly. Part of competence is knowing when you do not know things and then you make an effort to learn, underline to learn and also to get that experience. The combination of learning and, and experience, which is the practical, that leads to integrated learning. Being knowledgeable about safety is not, is not enough. But a greater understanding of the strategic, financial, and organizational context in which safety function operates can prove productive. So you basically need to have an understanding of the business that you're working in. How do they make money? How do they make decisions for you to be able to see uh, where safety comes in and, and also how to crack a balance between safety and production. And in, in, in most cases, we, 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 uh, we emphasize the cost of non-compliance in, in the meetings, whenever we meet with management. Um, it, it's very important to stress that we need to explain the indirect costs of, of accidents, which is like loss of production, training, legal costs, the cost of hiring new employees uh, that do not have the same experience the candidate had. Safety will always be looked at as an overhead or a cost unless we crunch the numbers. We, we, we need to be able to demonstrate in terms of numbers what we mean and what does it translate it to at the end of the, of the sausage machine. We also have to give a sustainability view how to balance the triple bottom line, the three pillars that I spoke about earlier. Um, Competencies, they compress of a set of defined behaviors. I hope you can see behaviors or standards that provide a structured guide, enabling you to be able to identify the standard or a behavior, to be able to develop that behavior or a standard, and also to be able to evaluate that behavior so that one can be declared competent or they can be able to do their job. One may ask, how does one become competent? You become competent by training. And when you uh, uh, go for the training and you finish it, you get a certificate. You also become competent by experience, where you can get a validation certificate to say, this guy's experienced in, in this area. Just as an example, um, for you to see uh, how training and experience come in, you would see it in the legal requirement of the GMR2 appointee, supervisor for machinery. Um, in an area or a machine where um, a company is engaged in the activity, they have to employ someone who is an engineering apprentice plus five years experience. So his training plus experience, they make him competent. Integrated learning, what you learn plus the application. In an attempt to speak to safety professionals this morning, I decided to identify only six, six areas that I think that if we can uh, work on them, we'll be able to uphold safety um, in the regard it deserves. The first one that I looked at is personal credibility. Um, for companies, management, teams, and projects to be able to deal with us, to be able to hear the message that we have to contribute in those structures is we have to be people who commit to uh, what we said we are going to do. Do what you said you are going to do. 
And also, when you go higher in your, in your organization or in a project where you are an advisor, you would learn that confidentiality of information is very, very critical. That you cannot just share any information with just anyone. You are, you, are, you are privy to contractual information, pricing of those contracts that you cannot sh share with anyone. You have to be honest and, and forthright with, with people. And you should be able to, 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 you know, to take care of business and take a fair share of the workload. You have to be someone that is responsible. If you have made a mistake, you have to admit that you made a mistake. I can cite one incident where a project engineer asked me for an advice where we're doing excavation under a power line. I made a mistake in terms of um, meters and, and the, the American uh, SI unit. I had, I had to accept that I, I confused myself in terms of the meters. In South Africa, we use meters, and, and the other guy was talking in, in feet. Also, you need to be someone that conveys a command of relevant facts. We need to be talking facts and not just blowing up smoke. Number two, flexibility is very important for you as a safety professional. You should be able to see merits of a perspective of other people in a team or in your own department. You also need to be open to organize new organizational structures, procedures, and, and technology. Not every company works the same. Every company has its own structures, procedures, and technologies that they use. So you need to be flexible to be able to, um, to operate in a team or an organization. Um, also, it's critical to be able to adapt to a different strategy when an initially selected one is unsuccessful. Basically, you need to be like a common... Once again. Can you hear me? Just with me. Uh, we can hear you. Please, uh, AG, please mute your Thomas? device. Please. Hello. Okay. Uh, as a safety professional, you should be able to adapt to a different strategy when an initially selected one is unsuccessful. Basically, you should be more like a chameleon. You should be able to change in the different circumstances that requires you to change and operate in. And you should be able to, to, to modify a strong held position in the face of contrary evidence. And you should be able to know what a want and a need is. The timing is, is very important. When you look at, it, at the, the specific time in the project or in an organization, you should be able to say, this is a need, this is a want, we can wait, this we cannot wait. Thirdly, you should be able to, to make decisions, decisiveness. This is very, very important. For those of you who work in projects, you will uh, attest to this, that you should be able to make a decision in a timely manner. Time is of essence. You cannot wait more and more and more. You need to think on your feet and be able to make a decision. We should be willing to make decisions in difficult and ambiguous situations when time is critical. Time, time, time is always of essence. You should be able to make a decision on your feet. And you should be also be able to take charge of a group when it is necessary to facilitate change. Change is the only constant. So you should be able to facilitate change. Overcoming an impasse or a cul-de-sac face issues or ensure that decisions are made. Basically, you are a decision maker. The fourth one, thoroughness. You should be a professional who's thorough in whatever you do. You should be able to set up procedures to ensure that high quality of work is maintained and produced. 
you should be able to monitor the quality of work and verify information. I had a funny and an interesting tendency that when I had a group of safety officers, I would not take a statistical report on a Friday afternoon just before knockoff. And my team knew this. If you send me a report four o'clock in the afternoon, I would not read it. I would just send it back to you and say, um, please review the report. If you send it again and it had changes and you know, would have a laugh and you'd have to explain to me why you had to change uh, the report. Had I taken in the first go, I'd have taken the wrong information. So it's very, very important for one to be able to verify the quality and the information that is given. Accuracy of your own work. You cannot expect other people to be accurate, to give you quality work. If you yourself, you cannot check the accuracy of your own work. You should also have systems that will be able to, to guide you, keep you on track uh, in terms of meetings, in terms of actions that you're supposed to, to report on. Then the fifth one, some of you will be very interested to, to hear about technical expertise. As safety professionals, we, we, we are trained in, in the field that we are in. Some of us are engineers, staff are just purely safety professional. We come from different back, back, backgrounds. Um, but wherever you are, whatever organization or company that you find yourself in or a project, you should possess an in-depth knowledge and skill in that area. I, for one, am in the pipelines. I had to make sure that I get to understand the business of, of, of pipelines. What are the critical activities involved in the construction of, of, of pipelines? So the technical acumen is, is very, very important. You should be one that, that is able to develop technical solutions. You cannot always depend on the grandfather rights. Um, we cannot operate on the new way of doing things because these things in the past, they used to work very well. We safety transitions with, with time and technology moves. You should be one who is sought out as an expert to provide advice or solutions in your technical area. So you should be a well-seasoned um, safety professional and you can be called in counted on and you are you are able to give uh, solutions you keep yourself informed about cutting edge technology in your in your area there's a lot of technology that we as safety professionals can on, can uh, uh, um, leverage on to be able to bring solutions to the organizations and and projects that we find ourselves in the last area that I wanted us to look at is results orientation. Organizations are in the business of making money, profits. So results, results, results are very, very, very important. So you should be able to focus on desired re results of one's own or units of work. So you should know what is it that you want at the end of the day. What is expected of you from your unit or your department? You should be able to set goals, focusing effort on the goals and meeting or exceeding them. You should be able to um, um, develop challenging but achievable goals. You, sh you should also be a person of commitment to the very same goals that you have set um, in the face of obstacles and, and frustrations. Commit commitment can be seen where uh, you have to reach or submit a technical expectation, uh, 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 specification to your technical guy and, and you're supposed to knock off. You, you need to show your commitment by putting an effort and time to make sure that you reach that, that goal. Um, you, you need to be a person that has a strong sense of agency about solving problems and getting work done. As I said that 
companies and projects are all about results, results, results. Results are very, very important. Results lead to what companies were created for. And then um, let's go on, should one join or register with a professional or a certification body? This is a question most of the people ask. Continuous professional development of your knowledge and skills is very, very, very important. I can't stress this enough. It's also important to know that a well-seasoned, experienced and resourceful safety professional it's an asset to a project or an organization, and you will always be required at a premium. We want people that are knowledgeable and experienced in these organizations and projects. We don't just want pure academics or people that depend on grandfather rights. I'm exempted to comply or to work on, on new requirements, new technology, because the technology of the past was able to, to give results. Um, there are different professional bodies or associations that one, one can um, associate or register with some of which are industry, industry requirement and a legal requirement. For an example, your SACP, CMP, which is for construction guys, and, and a lot of people are interested in associating with them and getting them uh, to register them. Another one which is a functional association is the Southern African Institute for Occupational Hygienists, where I came from. If you want to be a hygienist, you'd have to be registered with SAYO. And, and it's, 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 it's quite interesting to, uh, to have observed that when you associate with institutions like this, that's a wealth of information that can help you to become a well-seasoned professional. Some of which are job requirements uh, locally and internationally. For those that are in the different countries, you would have heard that if you're a CSP, you, you smell like a rose. Others are registered with IOSH. Others are registered with NIBOSH. Others are very fond of the OSHA, OSHA standards. So depending on where you are, these professional bodies um, are very good to associate with. And, and it's also good to know that there are voluntary ones like HSC Connection, SIOSH that you can register with um, to be able to network with other professionals. Mm -hmm. Then let's look at the benefits of registration or association with these professional bodies. You'll stay up to date with industry changes. You'll be able to attend workshops just like this one and show no, uh, share knowledge with your peers. You'll also be able to accumulate CPD points for those trainings and workshops that are accredited by the professional bodies that you associate with. Um, new professional opportunities. If you're looking for uh, a professional opportunity wherever you are, uh, you could um, associate with your NIBOSH, your CSPs, and, and other professional bodies. Um, associating with these bodies also help with your, to keep your skills up to date and to do your job effectively. And, and also there is a potential for a salary increase and a promotion. In conclusion, keep learning, anything will happen. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joseph. Excellent presentation. Um, we did say that it would be a little bit short because we're going to allow for questions um, and some statements. I know I'm sure there's going to be quite a few that are going to be coming through. 
So um, we'll allow for, for any questions. Uh, please raise your hand or, or go ahead and we'll acknowledge you and you can ask your question. Thank you. Yeah, Fabian, it's Llewellyn, are you? How's the Lubav Slaka, man? Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Joseph, uh, I think the presentation is good. Um, and also with regards to to us as uh, safety professionals or practitioners, we obviously need this type of uh, um, competencies, as you mentioned. Um, one of the questions I have is, you know, uh, and I think it's on a lot of people's minds, we are registered with uh, SACPCMP. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, from my, as a personal point of view, uh, I'm not sure what the benefits are with registering with them because, <laughs> as you said, if you register with these organizations, it, beca- it comes at a benefit to you. Um, so I'm not sure what the benefit is. And secondly, uh, with regards to CPD points, um, um, there's no clarity on that. Um, I don't think uh, SACP, CMP has clearly identified how we should be earning these points unless we really have to go dig in and look for that to, in order for us to, to maintain our registration. And uh, um, I fear that um, soon to come, lots of people might be deregistered because of not knowing what, how to register or what type of CPD points we have accumulated over these years. And, um, and they haven't been clear on that. So yes, it's, it is a good thing. I mean, if you look at HSC Connection Point in the, in the short space of time that this organization has been here, I think they've done much more than if I can say what SACPCMP has done uh, in all the years that we pay in our registration, just as an as a information for my side. Yeah. Thanks, Well. Um, good points. Can I, can I jump in here one second, Joseph? Um, okay. What, what Llewellyn has mentioned, yes, there's a lot of truth behind it. I, I agree with it. Um, what I will try and do is I will speak to um, a lady from SACPCMP that's in charge of uh, the training and CPD and ask her if they would, if they would be willing to conduct a workshop on that uh, so that they can have uh, ensure proper clarification uh, regarding the CPD and how people can um, uh, obtain CPD points. So I, I've taken that point, Llewellyn. Thanks a lot for that. I will try my no, best to arrange it. Yes, mm-hmm. and, and, and I and thank you very much for that. But and that's mm-hmm. just my point that um mm-hmm. that you just um underlined for me is mm-hmm. that somebody else has to go and ask them to do that <laughs> for something they should be doing on their own already. So <laughs> this is my point, just for a confirm. No, to Lou. Thanks, brother. <laughs> okay. Anybody else, please, um, like to comment or share any anything regarding the the presentation today. I see Alex's hand is up. Alex, you may go ahead. Hi, good morning, Tim. Good morning, Joseph. How are you doing? I'm okay. How are you, sir? Fantastic, thanks. Joseph, with regard to learning, I see uh, your conclusion, keep learning, earning what happened. Okay, with regard to learning, um, now that we're in the lockdown, um, I've been looking for free courses to do online. And, um, you know, I've been just grasping it at almost anything. I'm actually busy right now studying chicken welfare and behavior. Um, I've done a few <laughs> courses on Ellison and Coursera. You yes. know, just to keep my mind busy. With regard to those online courses by organizations uh, such as Ellison and Coursera, are those recognized internationally and or locally? Fabian, Fabian, can I, can I come in? Yes, yes, Joseph, you may. Go ahead. Look, we... Most of us have gone online to look for courses that will keep us busy during the, the lockdown. Uh, There's a myriad of courses that are offered online, Harvard, your course, and St. Charles, the Canadian, that one can, can, can do. It's very difficult to say that those courses are accredited uh, by, by you know, bodies that we associate with. Uh, but what I would say that is that they increase the knowledge that one has um, in that specific subject that one would take online. Uh, let's say Kosh, Kosh Essentials, for an example, you mm-hmm. would learn how to conduct a risk, a risk assessment. 
Mm. But I, I wouldn't be confident to say that sh for sure that they are accredited, okay. but they will increase your knowledge. Yeah, that's true. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rosa. Sabian, hi, it's Said here. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Said, I just, uh, Musa's hand was up. I'll, I'll okay. show you now one second. Musa, go ahead, please, brother. Morning, gents. Morning, uh, just one question there. Uh, you're talking about technical, uh, giving technical solutions. As you are in the power industry, if I, if I remember you say, or pipeline, sorry. Yes. Uh, can you give us an example of a technical solution that you've given to your client or your company to institute on a project? Thanks. Um, yeah, there, 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 there are a few solutions that I have I have uh, advised the project to have. Uh, uh, look at um, working in a life plant where there's underground cabling and, 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 and services. Um, there, there is a requirement that you, you have to determine if there are any existing um, uh, facilities or services underground um, where you have to, to be definitely, definitely sure that when you excavate, you are not going to damage any, any underground pipe or, or services. Um, you can have a, a, a pipe detector or a cable tester that you employ to, to, to scan the area in terms of the drawings for the facility to be able to pick up this underground services to ensure that um, the job is completed safely without damaging any 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 asset. Thanks. Thanks, Joseph. Okay, so, uh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry uh, Fabian. Will that oh. not fall under business as usual principles? Uh, but but it's it's in it in, in its in itself a technical in nature. Okay. Um, so, so, so you could you could see it as a business as 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 usual, but in another company they might they might not uh, do the same. But you, as a safety professional, you need to say, look, there is an option of of using this equipment to be able to do the job safer and and, and quicker. Yes, yeah. there are companies where it's business as usual, but mm. not every company works the same. Yeah, it's true. No, thank you. That's true. Um, obviously, you also mentioned as well that they are, are safety engineers, which means that they are qualified engineers within a specific area and, and their expertise are within a specific area as well. So they also have the technical knowledge and expertise uh, to make certain decisions or to give guidance, for an example, as well. And some of us, we learn the expertise and the technical expertise as we're going along. If you're looking at lifting and rigging plans, etc., where you learn about it, looking at uh, deflection on 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 a structure as it's been lifted, etc. So there's 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 things that we learn in the technical let's say the technical space, um, and we can give our advice and 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 expertise on that as well. I agree with you, there, Joe. Thank you, um, Warren. Okay. Your hand was up before side, and then we can go to side. Uh, greetings, everybody. Hi, Warren. Go ahead. Uh, uh, thanks, Joseph. I think it was a, it was an informative uh, presentation. The the, the 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 one thing I want to emphasize uh, your your first point on uh, personal credibility. Uh, I, I don't know when last have we ever had anybody talking about ethics in in occupational health and safety practice. Sure. You know, I, I think yeah. I think it's one of the seriously under um, discussed uh, you know aspects of our work. Mm. You know, um, how do we how do we relate to 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 the workers who are our our, our main clients? You know, in our work, yeah. how do we how do we how do we relate to them? How do we respect uh, you know the the the, the 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 their ownership of occupational health and safety? You know, all these various issues that can go under the heading of ethics. I think it's a it's a thing that we we we, we don't discuss and terrify. I don't even know if there's an ethics standard or code or something for this for this profession. So it's another aspect that we need to work on and, 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 and adopt for ourselves as a collective. Thanks. Thanks, Warren. Thank That's you, Warren. Thank you. Um, Said, you may go ahead. 
Yeah, good morning all. Good morning. Uh, just on on the point of professional development, yeah, I, I do see a, a major gap in in terms of uh, improving. As right now we don't have a set standard for the safety profession in South Africa. Mm. So I, I, I would think one, one of one of the key challenges we have uh, kicking off now is is to get on ta on the table or around the table mm. to establish this. It's it's also one where uh, we've been pulled from left to right uh, in terms of what are the criteria and and a lot of organize, organizations are using nibosh and others as criteria when they're not and they should not be using those as criteria uh, the second one was around uh, trainings now professional development comes in three forms yeah? it, it comes in and it can be linked to your uh, cpd where you collect these points and I think Llewellyn raised a valid query in terms of how do you track what's been accumulated and how does it benefit you when it is accumulated? Mm -hmm. Secondly is the essential skills. Normally we would call them soft skills. Mm -hmm. Now you don't need to collect points on these. Eh? It, it comes over time. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage all professionals to, to actually focus on those essential skills. Uh, previously called soft skills and the the knowledge base improvement as Joseph mentioned is vital for an HSE profession it's 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 vital especially if you if you are gonna be looking now at our current challenges uh, faced with restarting of work or continuing work on on various construction or non-construction activities the second one is, is, is what uh, was raised just now by Warren is on ethics. And I, I think it's time now that as South African professionals, we, we, we start looking at our own codes and standards and, and developing the programs necessary for, for, for South African professionals. Uh, I mean, if you, if you go globally, you, you'll see the amount of South Africans working in almost every sector of industry globally. And, and when you talk to these guys, they're from South Africa. So we, we have the potential, we're just not putting the right mechanisms in place to actually get pushed further as, and, and recognized. And, and then lastly, uh, Fabian, just from your side there, eh? mm. what's being done in terms of recognizing uh, South African training in terms of from an international point, if if guys want to work internationally, can they can they have their trainings recognized? I know with the tertiary education, yes, the the diplomas, especially the the, the BTEC degrees, etc., um, can be done. I know uh, Brendan has done years for for America when he was applying for the BCSP, the ASP. So it can be done. You just got to pay a couple of thousands of rands and then you can get it done. It's, it's, it can be done. But regarding short courses, not many of them. I know in Namibia, for an example, I think in Botswana as well, you can use like a SAM track and those. But internationally on a larger scale, no, they, uh, most of the companies prefer the, the, the Niboshes and the Ayoshes and the, the Oshes, et cetera. So we were just, just, just discussing the same thing myself and Joseph before we started earlier. And we were just saying that we need to have our own uh, criteria and our own qualifications that are recognized in the world as well and respected as such. Hi, Fabian, can Thanks. I add to that? Yes, Musa, you can go ahead. Okay, uh, just on, on, on in terms of the recognition of qualifications, what we must also understand is that out there in the world, and I think, Saeed, you can also attest to this, Fabian, you've also been international. Mm -hmm. You've been international. Uh, what, what we need to understand is that people are they governed by the NQF level. So, of course, like SAMTEC, it's a mm -hmm. certificate. It's not based on an NQF uh, level. Mm -hmm. So when we look at our diplomas uh, or, or associate degrees, 
degrees, uh, bachelor's degrees, honors degrees, masters, PhDs, those are based on NQF levels. So it's a priority that we, we, we move the ones below us in, in, in mindset, in attaining education, because that's the first principle that works outside. Mm. Is that people look at your education level, base it on an NQF level, and then move forward from there. Your, certif your certificates are not NQF based, so they, they don't have an international standard to look at your, your SAM check or your HIRA and say, you know, this conforms to that or this conforms to this. Mm. However, if you've got a diploma or a, a degree or a postgraduate diploma, there's an NQF level where that sits on and, and they have a basis to judge your, mm. your, your qualification and say, okay, this guy has this, he's from South Africa, so it meets this international standard. And that's why we need to get guys to understand the NQF levels, number one, why education is important, pursue safety uh, courses that have an educational equivalent, an NQF level, then push over to certificates that give you uh, technical experience, if I can call it that, because mm. those are short-term courses, they, they build you up to be technically efficient in something. Mm. So in, in that line, yes, uh, we, if, if, we, if we do that, most of our guys that are working overseas have education first. Mm. So they've got a, a, a honors or they've got a higher diploma, which is equivalent to a bachelor's degree. They've got, they've got a postgrad, which is equivalent to an honors degree. So they have that stuff. That's why they're working internationally. First time. Thank you, Misha. Thank you very much. Um, I see, Ms. Uh, to, to, to the lower guys. Thanks. Uh, I see a, um, Magoro, your hand is up. Please go ahead. Thanks, Fabian. Hi, Thanks, thank Joseph. Thank you. Um, for, for an excellent um, presentation. You spoke of upholding the discipline and keep on learning. I think one thing that we shouldn't forget as safety professionals is mentoring and coaching. Yes. So I would just like to appeal to everyone um, to avail themselves in terms of mentoring you know up and coming or whoever that needs it because um it, it it will contribute towards upholding the discipline whether formal or informal mm -hmm. it doesn't matter um but it will definitely um make a difference in someone and definitely uphold the discipline thank you thank you so much and that was the reasons for these workshops as well as to to mentor, uh, to, to, uh, to give those that know a bit more to share with others that know a bit less, and also to have open discussions based on these topics so that others can learn from it and we can learn from each other as well as we grow within the industry. But thank you very much for that point. It's well received. Uh, any other questions or topics? Sorry, any other questions or points that you'd like to raise? Um, I just, I'd like to share one, if I may quickly, pertaining to what you mentioned, you know, something that I've picked up through the years and a lot of professionals need to learn this is know your, your contracts that you are working with on, on your, within your company. It's so important that you, 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 you when the, the day that you start on that site, you go to the, to the contracts management or project management, get a copy of that, of that contract read through, understand what were the sections pertaining to safety. If you can get a PDF searchable version where you can search for relative safety topics or areas uh, specifically talking around safety, read it, learn it, highlight it, and, and know it. Uh, it's, it's important when you have situations with difficult contractors, with difficult, uh, difficult project managers, et cetera, from the contractor side as well, um, where you need to, to sometimes write those stern emails to them and, and, and refer to the section in the contract, refer to the relevant clauses at times, because it does give you a, a, an advantage if you know the contract. A lot of the time, these people only talk contract. So understand it, know it. Uh, if you have opportunities to also go on a few additional courses, learn about NEC3, learn about the FIDICs, uh, uh, contracts that are around JBBC, JBCC, et cetera, or JBBC, excuse me, 
Um, so, so learn these. It's, it's, it's very, very important. As safety people, we take this for granted and think it's not our area of expertise. It's not our responsibility to focus on it. But believe you me, it has helped me many a time. And, and actually, you put your contractor in their place in many occasions when you can refer to the sections in the, in the, in the contract. And they actually look at you and say, I got no, I got nothing else to respond with regard to that because contractually you have them where you need them to be. So just some advice as well, take it or leave it, but uh, it's, it's worked for me tremendously in the past. And I agree with, um, with uh, Joseph as well. You know, even when you go into meetings, et cetera, if you're going into a meeting, uh, be well prepared, be well versed in, in, in the topic or, or the discussion that's going to be held within that meeting. I've seen it happening in the past where guys go into a meeting and they're ill-prepared and they make themselves like fools. So make sure that you prepare yourself very well. If it's an item relating to a section in the law, go and do your, your research on it. Or a topic relating to something that's going to be discussed, go and do your research on it. Go watch a video on YouTube, etc., that you can understand a bit more on the topic and the technical uh, background regarding that point. So that's just my two cents worth if I if I may, regarding this uh, topic that Joseph has shared on now. Thank you. Uh, anybody else before we close? Anybody else that would like to share something? Fabian, just one more point from my side. Yes, Warren, go ahead. Uh, just again to, 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 to repeat, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, jump on the SACP, CMP issue, <laughs> but um, everybody knows my, my, my yeah, situation yeah. there. <laughs> the, 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 the fact of the matter is that we don't have an OSH Professions Act. Mm. I think um, everybody needs to be aware of that. Yeah. Uh, you can't be a professional in terms of the way the law is operating, operates. Mm. You can't be a professional unless your professional designation is, de is defined in a, OSH, in a Professions Act. And uh, it, it, everything that we've been discussing about training and all of that and accreditation, all hinges around that that OSH, that Professions Act, because that uh, that act creates the the, the, the infrastructure that, that sorts out all these things. I mean, we we can talk about uh, uh, you know I mean doing a, a national diploma, BTEC. Let me say the one from from say UNISA, um, but it it, it 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 has a lot of work. The, the syllabus needs a lot of uh, enrichment, and. Um, you know, if there was a professional body that was that had, uh, you know what I mean, um, the committees and so forth working with that, we'd, we'd, we'd be far down the road uh, in terms of the quality of education, which relates back to your point uh, around things like the contracting and everything. That's supposed to be in our curricula. Curricula, you know, 100%. That's, a, that, that's supposed to be, the, we're supposed to learn those things in those years. It takes you four years to get to get a BTEC safety management. And mm. I, I they, more than talking about the OSH Act and a couple of regulations, then nothing about contracting and all those implications or costing and all those issues uh, are, are in that. Uh, it's 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 mostly a, 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 a it's mostly a, 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 a human resource management curriculum if you if you study it. So so guys, bear in mind we still have to fight to get the OSH Professions Act so that we are. We are stand toe to toe, and we get the respect as professionals. And but until then, uh, we have to teach each other via these forums. So, thanks. Thanks, Warren. Me the thanks. If, if I may, I just want to share something with you guys. So I worked a bit in Singapore. Um, one of the, the documents or the regulations we work with is the Workplace Safety and Health Workplace Safety and Health Officers Regulations. That clearly defines what is the functions of a safety officer, what are the requirements, uh, how they need to be registered with the local Ministry of Manpower, etc. within Singapore. So I agree with you, Warren, this is definitely something that should be high up on the department's uh, list of objectives to do, and I will raise it in the next uh, technical meeting that we have as well. I have also raised the point pertaining to uh, let's say streamlining the, 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 the competency or qualifications within the current curriculum. There was some talks of uh, discussions with a professor that was uh, had prepared something, I think from the University of Val, if I'm, if I'm not correct. Um, but it's still early stages as to what it's going to entail. And, and, and definitely our input is going to be needed 
uh, from all professionals within the country so that we can improve on that uh, on that area especially. Thank you. Um, I see another hand up, Vusi Trele. Please go ahead, Vusi. Vusi, I see your hand is raised. You can unmute yourself and you can share. Hi, everyone. Hi, Vusi. Uh, go ahead. Yes, I, I, I've got a question here. In, no in, yes, in, in terms of COVID-19, is, 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 is there any law we, we, which, we, we, which compel a, an employer to pay an employee if he's, he gets positive during the working hours? Mm, I can come in here. I think I, I'm not a I'm not a COVID expert and a professional in the industry. But as far as I am aware, if an employee gets COVID nineteen, they need to report it to the compensation commissioner. Um, so there will be no direct compensation from an employer to an employee. It would fall under the compensation, uh, the, the compensation and uh, occupational injuries and diseases act. Um, so, therefore, your the answer in, in a nutshell is no. Uh, an employer would not be paying an employee directly if, if they contract COVID, even if it is proven to happen at work. Um, <clears throat> that's why the department refers to the to the compensation commissioner with regard to that. Hope that un explains, we'll see. All right, thank you. Uh, anybody else would like to share? Before can, I, can, I, can I add in another point there, Fabian? Sorry. You, you may want to. The, the, there's the, there was that circular about occupationally acquired um, COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing we need to educate workers on is that in terms of that thing, I think the if there's uh, temporary total disability, it's only for 30 days that uh, the period of time that people will get compensated for. Okay. So unless there's a death, which is which will obviously will have a different you know, investigation and compensation. Okay. But in the main, people are only, if they, you're booked off sick, you're only going to get that um, a maximum of 30 days uh, uh, according to your according to the calculation. I think maybe 75% of your salary or something like that. If somebody can correct me there, but it's only for a period of maximum of 30 days. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Thanks for that input. Okay, um, if there's nothing else, we can close the session. Uh, Fabian, I, I'd like to just say uh, that. The, the sessions have been be very beneficial. But I'd like to set up a challenge uh, in terms of the point raised on mentoring. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to mentor five of the members, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'd like any of the other HSC professionals uh, that are connected to HSC Connect to equal or better those five. <laughs> Good, good. Challenge, I, I think challenge we have to, yeah, we, we have to, we, we have to have outcomes from these sessions. Yes. And this is one of them. And I, I, I secondly like to hear more on the Occupational Health Professional Act. So if we can work on that, mm -hmm. it, it will be good. Okay. But thanks, I, I'd, I'd like to, to see us challenging each other more. Yes. And 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 making sure that the professionals are are getting an advancement in terms of of being supportive by us that have the various skills and experience. We can also learn from them, by the way. No, so that's over true. the years, oh yeah, over the years, I've learned a lot uh, from IT. Uh, because the new generation, I'm not saying I'm old, but the new generation are very tech savvy. So what you give them, they also give stuff back to you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Fabian. Thank you. Sir. Thanks, so, Joseph. Thanks a lot for it. Sorry, quickly, I see two more hands up. I think we'll take these last two hands and then we can close. Uh, Lizelle, you can go ahead. Lizelle Smith. Hi, hello, Lizelle. <clears throat> okay, Lizelle's not responding. Uh, Nandi, you can go ahead. Hello, everyone. Um, Hi, yes, um, with regards to what Venon has said, um, I would like to 
be part of uh, those five who are going to be mentored by him. Okay. I don't know if we can get details maybe in the group yes, yes, on um, how we can contact him. <clears throat> what I'll do is um, the, the people that put their names forward, they can send me a WhatsApp and then I will forward the, the, the contact numbers to Saif um, and then he will contact you guys for the mentoring. Okay. Okay thank, you. Happy with that. okay, thank you, Fabian. Okay, thank you, Nani. Okay, uh, if there's nobody else, let's close the session. I think it was really fruitful, the discussions as well. And, and as Joseph rightfully did, um, he knew that there was going to be quite a lot of discussions after this presentation, which was healthy. And I think that we also grow and learn a lot from each other from these discussions. So again, thank you everybody. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Much appreciated for your time and efforts. We really appreciate it and for everybody for your attendance. Um, have a great day and a safe day out there. Thank you very much. HSC Connection Point, you always connected. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.